Okay, well, good evening from Boston College and welcome to our human-centered engineering webinar. I hope that you and your loved ones are enjoying a safe and healthy fall. I can certainly speak on behalf of all of us here in the greater Boston area uh, that it is absolutely starting to feel like fall in these parts. And it is a great time of year to be on campus. My name is David Weber. I am an associate director in the Office of Undergraduate Admission. And I also have the pleasure of moderating tonight's session. I am honored to share this platform with some fabulous guests that I'm gonna introduce you to in just a moment. But first, no matter where you're tuning in from or what stage of the admission process that you're in, we're just thrilled that you've taken time out of your evening to join us, to learn more about Boston College, to learn more about our human-centered engineering program and what makes this program and this major from our students to our faculty and the opening of our new facility, what makes it distinct, what makes it so special. So I'm confident that the information that we share with you tonight will meet you wherever you're at within the college search. And of course, for those of you who are high school seniors, we recognize that there are some admission deadlines that are looming in the next week or so, and certainly over the next few months as well. So I hope that the de detail that we provide within this session is helpful as you consider submitting applications in the weeks and the months ahead. And if you do have questions this evening, um, I ask that you submit those questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So use the Q&A button to submit your questions. The chat function for this webinar is disabled. So all questions need to come through the Q&A button. And as moderator, I'm gonna do my best to get to as many of them as we possibly can. We'll try to cover as much ground as possible. Tonight, I'd like to introduce you to four members of the Human Centered Engineering Program, three of whom are Boston College current students. So soon you're gonna be hearing from Charlie, Charlie is a first year student coming to BC from Washington, DC. Uh, you're also gonna have the opportunity to hear from Nava. Nava is uh, a first year student coming to Boston College from Southern California. And then you'll also meet Elizabeth. And Elizabeth is again, a first year student as all of our engineering students are, who's coming to us from Baltimore, Maryland. And lastly, I'd like to introduce and kick off tonight's sec uh, session with the inaug inaugural Kozerich Chair of the Department of Engineering, Professor Glenn Gaudet. And this past year, Boston College was thrilled to welcome Professor Gaudet to campus where he is leading this incredible new program. Professor Gaudet comes to BC from Worcester Polytechnic Institute where he taught since 2004 as a professor of biomedical engineering. Professor Gaudet's research, which I'm sure he's gonna to touch upon in the next few minutes, is supported by the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation. Professor Gaudet is also executive counsel with the International Society for Cardiovascular Biology. As an undergrad, he attended University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, completed his master's in mechanical engineering at Georgia Tech, and his PhD in biomedical engineering at Stony Brook University. Professor Gaudet currently has two sons that are at WPI and his daughter who is in her first year here at Boston College. So Professor Gaudet, I'm gonna turn this whole thing over to you so that you can open up this conversation about human-centered engineering at Boston College. We can't wait to hear more from you. Great, thanks. Thanks a lot, David. And uh, like David said, thank you to everybody for uh, joining us here uh, today, tonight, wherever you might be, what time it might be. Um, and uh, I'm honored to be at Boston College and to share a little bit about the program with you. And uh, you, the reason for this webinar really is to share some of what we're doing here at Boston College, but also to try to entertain any of your questions. And so I wanna make sure we save enough time for uh, questions you might have. So, um, all right, let me jump right into it. Uh, tell you a little bit uh, you know, about myself. Dave did a pretty great you know, job introducing me. I, I grew up in Massachusetts, not too far down the road. Um, went to uh, UMass Dartmouth or Southeastern Massachusetts University when I was there in mechanical engineering, went down to Georgia Tech to get my master's in mechanical engineering. Um, they did not have a biomedical engineering program when I was down there. It started after I left. And then I went to uh, SUNY Stony Brook to do my PhD in biomedical engineering. And I've held uh, faculty positions at a few different universities. I stayed on after my PhD at Stony Brook and uh, had an appointment in biomedical engineering and uh, courtesy appointment in surgery and also physiology. 
and I was recruited to UMass Medical School in the Department of Surgery. Um, and then, uh, as David mentioned, I had left uh, uh, UMass Med to go to WPI, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with uh, Worcester, it's um, pronounced just like it's spelled there, as you can see. Uh, having a Massachusetts accent helped me with that one. Um, my scholarship, uh, I just briefly touch upon uh, really two major areas these days we're working in. One is tissue engineering and trying to uh, grow replacement organs and tissue for patients that uh, suffer from various different diseases. One of the things we've done in the past is uh, decellularized uh, spinach uh, and other plants. And so if you look at the uh, image on the lower right, you see uh, Bill Nye saves the world. And that's one of his Netflix, uh, Net Netflix uh, shows. He's actually looking at one of our decellularized leaves. Um, and so if you look closely at his face, you can see that. And basically what we're looking to do there is to create a scaffold. One of the important things in tissue engineering is a scaffold that holds the cells in place and allows them to contract, but also has a network of vessels to provide the, um, the cells that are growing with, with blood and oxygen and also to take the me metabolic waste away. Um, the other big area we're working in these days is cellular agriculture or lab-grown meat. And instead of trying to grow uh, in, the, in the case where um, Bill Nye is holding up that spinach leaf, we were trying to grow human heart muscle. Now we're trying to grow cow muscle and we're trying to uh, grow that for meat. So, and you know, again, happy to, to talk more about it if anybody's interested. So let me jump right into the program. Um, and really you know, the reason for this program is because we feel that students need the technical knowledge needed to be an engineer, but they also need a mindset focused on making the world a better place for others. And that's something that I really believe is missing from a lot of programs today and is something that the world needs. Um, we really need students who are interested in the technical mindset of an engineer, but also a mindset focused on using that knowledge, using the, you know, what's up here to make the world a better place for others and also to make the environment uh, better for others. So how are we doing that? We're incorporating the non-technical courses into the engineering education. All of our students in the engineering program are required to take the core curriculum at Boston College. That provides students with a multidisciplinary education um, focused really in, in humanities and liberal arts and social sciences. And we actually try to incorporate those into our courses. One of the things that we do is we have uh, four years of reflection seminars. And so once a week, we meet with the students to talk about how our courses, uh, for example, non-technical courses, making them the engineers that they wanna be, the engineers that the uh, world needs. Um, and again, it all uh, revolves around uh, the engineers for others and really the engineers I think that the world needs. Um, I'm fortunate to have a great uh, a group of colleagues and our faculty right now, we have seven of us, but we're uh, continuing to grow. Avneet Hera is um, an assistant professor. Her areas of, of interest are in engineering education, educational technologies, design education, maker spaces. One of the things that really is exciting to me uh, about her work is she's looking at using maker spaces to, um, uh, or, or essentially having maker spaces that are more accessible and inviting to everybody, but not, not just your classical engineer, but how do we invite everyone into uh, maker spaces? Brian Ranger is also an assistant professor. He's interested in medical devices, instrumentation, global health, imaging, uh, really looking at how do we think of low resource communities and how do we meet their needs from a medical point of view? Um, so Maria Isabel, Kana Sicheli is joining us uh, from University of New Haven this year. Um, her interests are in renewable energy, fluids, and engineering education. I've had the opportunity to work with her for a few years, and she's absolutely fantastic. Siddhartha Govadasamy is a professor. His areas are in wireless uh, and optical communications, rural broadband, uh, signal sensing, and, and uh, processing. Jonathan Crones 
is an assistant professor of the practice, and his main areas of, uh, of interest are environmental engineering, uh, industrial ecology, and sustainability. Uh, and his uh, incorporation into the program is really essential. Um, we want everybody to think about sustainability, regardless of, of what area of engineering you decide to go into. Jenna Ton is also an assistant professor of the practice. Her area of expertise is in the history of, of science and technology and women in gender studies in STEM. And so it's a fantastic group that uh, we're able to work with. Um, just want to share a little bit about our teaching philosophy uh, with you. We believe that every student can and should succeed. Um, every student should be able to graduate with an engineering degree in four years, regardless of you know, the background that you enter in with, whether you have AP credits or not. Um, we want this program to be inviting. We want students to feel comfortable in the program. Um, I remember when I was a first year engineering student at orientation, they told us to take a good look around because only one out of every four of us are gonna be graduating in four years with an engineering degree. That's the complete opposite um, that approach that we take here. We believe that every student can and should succeed in engineering if they want to. Now, if you come into the program and you decide that you have a passion for a different subject and you wanna transfer out of engineering, that's fine. That's fantastic. Um, that's not a problem, but we don't have a kind of weed out program. We also believe it's the faculty's job to help the students learn. We do that through project-based learning. We do that through active and collaborative learning. Um, we believe that engineering is fun. Is it challenging? Is it difficult? Is it hard? Yes, it is at times, but we do believe it's a lot of fun. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, that today's engineers really need to know the technical knowledge, but they also need a mindset for making uh, the world better for others and so for helping others. A, a quick overview of the curriculum. I'm not going to get into all the details, although I'm certainly happy to if you want. Um, in our first year, students take an analysis lab that helps them apply calculus and physics to engineering problems. And so calculus and physics are, are great foundational courses. And as engineers, we need you know, we need that strong foundation, but we really want to apply the calculus and the physics knowledge to solve engineering problems. Uh, in the second year, students will take foundation um, engineering courses. That'll give you a general background in engineering subjects such as circuits, dynamics, statics, material science, um, things like that there. And we're going to take a project-based approach to incorporating the, the math and science into the engineering. And so providing you with the information that you need in engineering and to hopefully make you uh, the engineer that you want to be. On the right is essentially the um, course layout for the four years. In the peach color is the math and science. In the green is the engineering courses. And in the kind of light purple um, is the core curriculum. There's also uh, two years of language um, that are required also. And if you have some you know, high school language that uh, you know, may uh, take the place of uh, some of those language requirements also. In the third year, uh, students begin to focus in their areas of interest. And so the areas we're gonna focus on in uh, the degree itself it will be a general engineering degree, but students will be able to focus in areas that include environment, energy and sustainability, and health. And really, uh, one of the exciting things uh, for me is this collaborative service engineering project. All our students are gonna uh, complete in their junior year, and it's gonna be an opportunity to use the knowledge that they've gained to actually make the world better for others, and so actually helping others. In addition, we want our students to work uh, with non-engineering partners, partners in the community, but also other students who are not engineering majors. Because when you get out into the working world, if that's what you do, decide to do, you can be working in teams, you can be working with uh, people from many, many different backgrounds. And so we think it's important that you start to get that experience now. In the fourth year, you'll have a capstone project um, that will allow you to apply that knowledge that you've gained over the past three years to addressing a real societal need. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, all four um, years, we, we have a one hour weekly reflection session. 
So, um, and just to summarize it on the right here, you see our, our current first year class and hopefully you can recognize uh, three of the students who you'll be hearing for uh, shortly. Educating engineers for others, again, that technical knowledge needed for an engineer, but with a mindset uh, that, that thinks about how do we help others. We believe every student can and should succeed in engineering. Um, it's the faculty's job to help students learn. My job, you know, I, the way I help you learn is through teaching, but ultimately it's you know, my job to help you learn. So engineering is fun. At least I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, hopefully the students will agree, but again, you can ask them all those questions if you want. Um, and research at Boston College is really a multidisciplinary um, uh, project and it's also a lot of fun. So with that, I will hand it uh, over to our student panel or back to David. Yeah, thanks so much, Glenn. And I appreciate that overview. I know that there are a lot of questions already coming in that we're going to uh, get into in the next couple minutes and we can address. Uh, but I certainly wanna make sure that we uh, provide an opportunity for some current students to share their experiences. Um, with regards to, to being at Boston College now for about two full months. Uh, when you engage with Boston College, when you visit us on campus, uh, when you engage in our virtual programming, uh, we put our students out front and we really feel that they're your best resource to, to really get a sense as to what it's going to be like to, to, to be a student here using the resources of the university. So I wanna certainly give us an opportunity to hear from them. Um, and maybe Nava, can we start with you and just a personal introduction of who you are, where you're from, uh, but maybe if you could start Nava and then Charlie and Elizabeth follow, tell us a little bit about perhaps reflecting over the past year, what drew you to Boston College initially? Um, and certainly what were some of the factors that, uh, that helped you decide that coming to Boston College in a human-centered engineering program was the right fit for you compared to some other options that may have been very attractive for you, but what was, what was it about BC? So Nava, maybe we start with you and then Charlie and Elizabeth fill in, and then we'll start to take a look at some of the questions coming in from, from the participants. Oh, Nava, we can't, we can't hear you. I think there's a mute button on the, there, there we go. Okay. <laughs> um, hello everyone. And thank you so much, David, um, for that nice introduction. My name is Nava um, and I'm from Orange County, California. And I would say that, first of all, it is such a pleasure to be here speaking on this panel, um, representing the new engineering program here at Boston College. Um, I'm so excited to be here because I love the program so much and I can't wait to talk about it. I would say that the number one reason why I chose the BC engineering program compared to other engineering programs is simply because the opportunity is so unique. I really was drawn to the opportunity to collaborate with world-renowned faculty and engage with such brilliant students, um, especially to incorporate our ideas um, from the ground up and to build this program. But at the heart of that is really the human-centered engineering approach. And it is so integral to the program and to um, who we are as like the engineering students. We are every day in our classes in engineering we're learning how to create solutions that are user-centered with empathy, how we can really integrate our technical knowledge for math and science and physics classes and really understand like what it means to be people, what it means to be human, you know, what it means to sit down with your user and really have a conversation and understand their needs and try to create the most ethical solution. And with that knowledge of what it means to be in a human-centered engineering program and what it means to be human-centered. When I was assessing um, many of the other engineering programs that I applied to, um, I was just so drawn to this uniqueness. Um, and I thought it would be so exciting for me, um, just a bit about my personality. I've always grown up loving math and science. Um, when I was little, my mom would call me her little engineer, like around the house, I'd always be fixing things and I'd love problem solving. and that was like the part of me that was more math and science-y. I've always loved physics and bio and, you know, math, all these subjects that are more STEM related. But then I also love to draw. I love to sing. I love to play music. I play guitar. There was another side of me that was so much more creative. 
I love public speaking. I did model United Nations in high school. Um, and I really thought that this program um, and all of its characteristics would allow me to integrate all of those unique skills um, into engineering, into problem solve, ultimately for the goal of making the world a better place. Um, and I'm so excited to be here. And I think it was just those characteristics, even though as an applicant, I had many questions, like why should I choose maybe a program that's less developed? That's definitely a question that crossed my brain. Um, and really at the heart of it, I just felt that it was the best choice. Um, I remember thinking when I opened my application and I got accepted, I just remember telling myself, for some reason, I just can't say no to this program. It's just so incredible. And I just know I want to be a part of it. And just these past few months, I can attest that it has been incredible. I have learned so much and I'm so excited to see how this program grows in the future and how we as engineering students can help to grow it. Um, and yeah, I'd say that's just a little bit of my story. So thank you. Great, thank you, Nava. Char yeah, Charlie, Elizabeth, please go ahead. Hi everyone, I'm Charlie. Um, like you mentioned, I'm from DC. Um, and what, what really stood out about me when I was applying um, to engineering at BC was, as Neva, as you mentioned, like the, the cross-disciplinarity nature of, of what human-centered engineering is. Um, now that I've gotten to campus, it, it's actually, it's become something that's actually like a big part of the program. I'm taking a that is a fantastic class. And I'm sure you guys can attest all the liberal arts classes are like, are they're, they're amazing. Um, and that's something I don't think you get at uh, maybe a more tech oriented school. Um, but that being said, there's also like a technical side to things that uh, I think is with BC's resources is on par with what you get um, somewhere else. Um, what also stood out to me was um, the, it's a small, relatively small class. So I feel like I've gotten, been able to get to know the professors really well. They're, they're very welcoming. Um, and I feel like I can go up to them and ask anything um, with us for the classes or, you know, even stuff outside class. Uh, they're very approachable. And that's been something that's been, that's been really, really nice, especially with adjusting to college, which isn't necessarily a super easy adjustment. That's been a nice thing to have, um, is having a really just friendly um, and super, super knowledgeable teachers. Um, so, so far, those have been the things that really stood out to me that, um, especially the things that were that were major questions when I was applying. Um, so I'm Elizabeth. I'm, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I'm not too far from Charlie. Um, to be completely honest, when I was first looking at schools, I BC was not on my list at all, simply because I knew I wanted to do engineering. And I didn't think that BC had an engineering program. Um, but as I did my research, and I just like one day was writing an essay for another school, um, I kind of was like looking up like what type of engineer do I really want to be and the BC Human Center Engineering Program came up and I remember like texting it to my mom and be like this is exactly what I want to do because before that I was really stuck between this like I really love humanities and analytical thinking and writing um, and I didn't want to give that up to go to a very technical centered school um, there were a lot of my friends are and they, they really enjoy that but I know that I'm gonna become a very different engineer who thinks very differently than they do. Um, and so, yeah, BC really was the program that fit everything in that I wanted. And um, I think it is creating the engineers that the future really needs. I think Glenn really spoke to it. Um, we're we're gonna think differently than the, the engineers that will come out of MIT or Georgia Tech or like schools that you might think of when you think of engineering. Um, and I think that will really set us apart in the future. We're, we're not just taking calc one through three and physics and like integral calculus our freshman year. We're, we're really getting into like what these real world problems are and how as engineers we can approach them and solve them. And I think that's really, really interesting. And just looking at my friends from other schools, um, I'm, I'm having a very different education than they are. And I, I think it's gonna really benefit me in the future. Great, thank you, Elizabeth, Nava, Charlie. I really appreciate all of your perspective. Um, I kind of want to keep it student-centered for a moment. And several questions have come through the Q and A, um, asking one: What is the size of the cohort of engineering students? And that is twenty-eight students make up our initial cohort of engineering students at Boston College. 
I know there were some admission-based questions on that. I can get into that shortly. Um, and then moving forward, each incoming class starting with this upcoming cycle will be 50 incoming students uh, in the engineering program. So with 28 students in the cohort that you all exist with, can you tell us a little bit about the culture, about the, uh, about the, the relationships that are already being established amongst the student groups, amongst the students with faculty members? Just talk to the, to the community aspect of it a little bit. I can maybe start us off on that Yeah, question. that's great. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, number one, the community is absolutely incredible. I really would say that from the very beginning, it was so amazing to see the cohort really come together um, and connect with each other like rapidly, like at a pretty quick pace um, and really see how we would help each other out and really engage, whether it was in class, asking questions in group projects. Um, for example, like in our innovation design class, we're always working in teams. Just seeing that no matter which team you were placed in, everyone was just so excited to share their ideas and to collaborate and to lead and to see how they can implement their perspectives to move a project forward. Or whether it's just we're in the library, um, like on a Thursday night, trying to get our physics problem set done. We're all just so eager to, you know, collaborate with one another and to help each other learn and to explain concepts to each other that maybe it's hard for one, but easy for another. Um, we see the collaborative aspect really penetrate um, many aspects of our experience in the program, whether it's doing homework, whether it's in class. Um, and maybe like the students could also add a little bit more to that and share from their experience as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, right when I first got to campus, it's very nice to have a smaller group of people where you see some familiar faces. Um, it, it's like the first couple days and weeks of school, and even still now, it's very easy to get lost in the crowd. Um, and it's just nice to have like a smaller group of people who I know everyone's face uh, and the teacher knows my name. Um, that's just kind of a very nice starting point. Um, and adding on to that, um, throughout high school, I know there were always a couple people who liked math and science, but most people like were, they didn't enjoy it that much. And it's such a new experience being around people who like get excited doing their physics problems like I do. And I'm sure you guys <laughs> also share that. Um, but it's just a different level we can connect on that I haven't totally seen before. Um, and that's been a really nice adjustment. Yeah, one thing that just to add on that neither of you mentioned, um, in high school, I don't know if it was going to all girls school or what, but I found a lot of my STEM classes to be very cutthroat. And like, if you were struggling, no one would really want to help you. Um, and I mean, you could meet with the teacher, but that was really all you had. Um, peers really didn't want to reach out or share their work because they felt like it was their personal work. And that's not at all the case here. I think we're a really tight knit group. We all know each other's names. I think we knew each other's names after the first week, really. Um, and we do so much group work that it doesn't, it's not like this is my work and that's your work. It's like, this is our work. And even with our physics problem sets, like we all turn our own problem set in, but I, I think every Thursday, basically we go through <laughs> and we're like, okay guys, yeah. so like, what did we do here? And if someone doesn't understand it, there's always gonna be someone there to walk you through each step, not just to give you the answer, to, but, but to make sure that you truly understand it. Um, and that's such a different experience um, than I ever had in high school or what I was expecting from most engineering schools. Yeah, I say like we're very close, like, yeah. and we became close like very quickly. Um, and I think it was really, really nice just to have like that group to go to. Like, I kind of see us as like a family, um, and we really do help each other learn. And I think we all care about each other's growth, which I think to have um, in a cohort is just so incredible. Yeah, it sure is. Um, Glenn, maybe I could ask you this question. And it's we're still talking about classroom dynamic and this cohort of 28 students that has become a family. Um, a couple questions have come in about the classroom experience. Uh, one in particular, do all 28 of these students take their engineering classes together? And then the second part of this question, Glenn, is in January, when we start the spring semester, we move into our new facility. And that is going to be an incredible new home for human-centered engineering and a couple other programs at BC. Can you speak to a little bit about what that building is going to present as well? Sure. So right now, um... The 28 students uh, do take all their engineering courses together. And so 
we purposefully had our, you know, our, our first class, our inaugural class to be about half the size of what we consider steady state. And they're, they're really helping us, you know, as we go through this, we rely on them a lot uh, for their feedback, you know, what's working, how can we make things better? Um, and so right now they're taking all the same classes because essentially we're offering one section of the engineering classes, but starting next year when we have 50 students come in and then we're going to start offering two sections um, for the engineering classes. Now, one of the things I want to, you know, just briefly touch upon is the importance of the, the non-technical classes, the non-engineering classes, and the diversity of those classes. And really, we want our students to, you know, not all be in the same, you know, five, six classes during the semester. They're going to be in the same engineering classes as a cohort group, pretty much. But when they're outside of that, you know, and I, you know, I think they can attest to it, they're taking different core curriculum courses in interacting with many students from many different backgrounds and many different uh, um, majors. So I think that's really important. Um, we're excited about the new building. I was just on a tour of it last week. It's absolutely looking amazing. Um, can't wait to get in there. We, our classes will start in there in January. Um, and we currently have a um, one classroom in, in Higgins that we, we use. Um, and one of the things, uh, yeah, students may have seen or, you know, on the uh, slides with the, the whiteboard tables that uh, we have in that, in that room. The students seem to really enjoy that. We're bringing those with us. We want that to be uh, essentially the student's room to use, you know, literally 24-7. We expect there to be activity, you know, 24-7 in, the, in this new, uh, the new building, um, whether it be not only our engineering students, but students from all different disciplines across campus to be in there. So I generally don't stay on campus that much after, you know, 10 o'clock at night. Um, but my guess is things are pretty busy. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if the students are still up uh, uh, hanging out at 2 a.m. Um, hopefully I'll see them when I come in at 6 a.m. also. Wouldn't that be great? Um, but I don't know if all students want to do that. So but yeah, starting next year, we'll have two separate sections of all the engineering courses um, you know, for the students to, to take. So they may not all be in the same, same classes. Glenn, just briefly, a, a question had just come in, as you mentioned, the two sections. Will they be the same exact sec, uh, section? Or while there'll be two sections, will it be the same exact content, material, pace, et cetera? Yes, yeah, the, it'll be the same material, the same learning objectives. Um, it, it may be two different faculty members. You know, and one of the things we're, we're trying to work out, um, and we will work out, um, is you know schedule for student athletes. We have student two student athletes in our initial cohort group. Uh, they both run cross country and, and track and field, and we think that's fantastic. Um, they practice at certain times of the day, and we you know respect that. And so, with next year's you know class, we want to offer as much of a, a range to make sure that our student you know especially our student athletes and students who have you know very different um, uh, you know responsibilities and things they want to do can do that, you know, and also uh, uh, take the required engineering courses that they, that, that they have to take for their degree. Great, thank you, Glenn. I, I, this question came in from Sarah, and Sarah, I appreciate uh, the way that you phrase this question. I'm gonna steer this one towards our students. Um, Sarah asked that when faced with challenges and struggles in the classroom, how do students typically address them and what sort of resources can you turn to for help? Tutoring, studying as a group, help from professors, um, in the first two months that you've been here on campus, have you been able to navigate any of the support services available to you? Yeah, um, I can start that one off. So um, personally, I've been doing a lot of group study um, in O'Neill Library. They have like study tables. Um, so, and there's also study rooms um, on the fourth floor, which are nice. But I've been doing like, especially physics. Uh, if you have four people in a room, one person or everyone together tends to be able to figure out the answer. Um, office hours is also a great resource, um, whether it's physics office hours, which is like a professor in the physics department, who has like a lot more students or the engineering professors, which are, they have a lot of time set aside for just us, which is really nice. So they're able to give us like a lot of personal feedback. Um, there's also a, a couple of TAs in our classes who are super friendly and great resource. Um, if you guys have any other things that you want to add? But that's what I've done for yeah. getting help. 
I think a lot, there's a lot that comes with being in the inaugural class of something. And I mean, if you'll be in the second year of it, it will still be very similar. Um, and so we get a lot of resources. They, they really want us to succeed. And so if they hear that there's a few people struggling in physics or in calculus, they literally set up like a study group and have an extra TA there to make sure that we're getting the help that we need. Um, and they're really assisting our learning with whatever we need it. The professors are so approachable, partially because it is a smaller cohort and they know five facts about each of us. Um, and they're always there after class if we have a question. Um, other thing I found is that the professors will help you in pretty much any engineering class that you have, um, including physics and calculus. Well, then that's not necessarily the class that they're teaching or that they have been trained to teach. They, they will do their best to help you. And I've had a professor who stayed for an hour and a half after class one day on a Friday to help me <laughs> with a physics problem. Cool. And like, that wasn't yeah. even his class. He was there until 5.30 on a Friday night trying to help me. And then emailed me back at like nine o'clock that night to like restate what we went over. And so like, they're so personable. They really want to help us. And they're so approachable. They, they're they always there for us. And I, I don't know if you want to speak to that as well. Oh yeah, definitely. I would say that the professors, both in engineering um, and just in our normal like STEM classes mm -hmm. and non-STEM classes have been so accessible. Um, I have definitely said that I've utilized the office hours and TA sessions um, that have been facilitated by the HCE program. The professors are so approachable, so easy to work with. Um, I would say like for the physical modeling lab, I've gone to office hours um, with the professor, Professor Gavin saw me, and he's been very, very helpful, very approachable. Um, and they really, really care about your learning and you can tell that they really care about your learning. Um, they are so patient when you ask questions. Um, and I just think it's so encouraging, um, especially in a new program, um, in a physical modeling lab, learning like engineering concepts and engineering terminology. Um, to have professors that are so open, um, I really would say that I feel so supported um, and with any questions that I have. Um, and I've also definitely utilized those office hour sessions with my STEM classes as well. So, yeah. Great. Thanks so much. Glenn, a couple questions have come in um, that I'd love to steer towards you. And this is, these are questions that uh, are, I think, often asked from prospective students and their families. Are students able to move through our engineering program, but also explore minors or opportunities to study outside of engineering, even to the extent of a double major? And I know that can be difficult given uh, the responsibilities of an engineering student. But for students who want to explore a minor or even potentially a double major, what is the pathway? What's what's the mindset of our program? So I think um, it, it depends on the individual student and it depends largely on you know, what types of credits they bring in. And so if they, for example, have already completed the um, foreign language requirement, that's four courses in the schedule that they then have openings. And so our engineering curriculum is very difficult to double major in. Um, minors at Boston College are generally about six courses and generally one of them can double count. And so really it's five additional courses outside of your engineering coursework. Um, and so if you come in, if students come in with AP credit um, or, you know, foreign language credit and they have the space or if they want to take summer courses, yes, they can do that. I also saw a question about, you know, pre-med. Again, very similar, you know, there's a lot more to pre-med than just the coursework too. And so um, I think, you know, it, it coming in with pre-med you're gonna to wanna to take organic chemistry and all these other courses. And so again, if you come in with AP credit or you come in already with foreign language, um, then that really helps out. If not, I would you know, strongly encourage you to consider taking uh, summer courses to really get some of those uh, pre-med, you know, the medical school requirements out of the way. Um, so I think a double major, we do have one student currently who's double majoring. Um, you know, she came in with a lot of AP credit um, and, you know, uh, she seems to be enjoying it. She seems to be working very hard, um, but uh, she seems to really enjoy it. So it, it's, is it doable? Yes. Do I recommend it? Probably not. Um, certainly not for every student. Um, 
Thanks, Glenn. There was also yeah, a question there too about uh, the concentrations. I saw that come up a couple mm -hmm. times, and so you know, the the degree is going to be is is a general engineering degree, but we're going to have different areas for students to focus on, and so those three areas are going to be in in health, in energy and sustainability, and environment. But it's not going to be a biomedical engineering degree. It's not going to be an environmental engineering degree. It's going to be a general engineering degree with a, a focus in environment. Um, and really that di is dictated basically by the courses that the students select. So if a student, for example, wanted to focus on um, more uh, robotics, for example, we could look and say, you know, there are different courses that I know we're going to be offering in the junior year that would help students in that area. And then, you know, if they need a, a specific robotics course, we could offer that at the, you know, technical elective, the junior senior year to give them the background to enter into the robotics, you know, engineering field. Um, it's not going to be a robotics engineering, you know, degree, uh, but it'll be um, a general engineering degree with a focus, for example, in robotics. So I hope that answers the question. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Glenn. I'm gonna uh, kind of steer this question towards the students, but open it up for all. Many questions have come in about internships, about co-ops, about research opportunities. And I know some of the students just in our conversations have spoken about how you know attending a program uh, that does not have any program alumni in the field itself, what does that mean psychologically as you chose BC? Was that a concern of yours? Uh, Jack, I, I think, uh, phrased it nicely, with this being an inaugural program and no engineering alumni to leverage, how are you thinking about industry connections, job placement, et cetera, upon graduation? So I'll pitch that to the students first, and I'm just curious about your thoughts as you think about internships, research opportunities outside of BC. What do you think? Yeah, that was, that was definitely one of the major unknowns when I was applying. Um, but what what I kind of what was what my what my reasoning was when I was applying and what I've realized since I've got here is as we've mentioned earlier the faculty are really invested uh, in our success in the classroom and also outside um, and I know a bunch of the faculty are really well connected um, which is which is one aspect of uh, getting jobs and internships in the engineering world um, and BC alumni are also. Um, I don't know any specifics, but they're pretty well connected in mm -hmm. non-STEM worlds that are also connected um, to, to more technical jobs. So there's definitely connections that are there. If they're not like, you know, specifically in um, like a type of engineering, um, but they, they do exist. Um, and the faculty, faculty being super invested in us um, is definitely, uh, definitely a big aspect for me. Yeah, kind of going off of that, I think we think of it a lot of times as this is the first class BC's never done engineering before. And yes, well, you technically never have had an engineering program before. BC's been doing engineering type things for a while, which is part of the reason they're able to do this on basically kind of just short notice. Um, and so the physics department, the chem department, the bio department, they're all doing very engineering-esque research already. Um, and then kind of similar to what Charlie said, there are a lot of connections there. Our professors are really knowledgeable and they have a lot of connections and they want us to succeed. Um, it might be a little bit more on us to find internships and to reach out, but that doesn't mean that they're not there. And I think really, as long as you take ownership of your learning, there will be as many opportunities as you can find really. Yeah, absolutely. And also to add, I do know that there are some professors in the engineering department that are doing research. Um, I know Professor Cadet is doing research. Um, so, and there's also many other clubs and organizations on campus um, that are engineering related where you can get co-ops and internships. Um, I would encourage you um, as students that when you come to BC to definitely reach out to professors, ask if they're doing research, whether that is an engineering professor or a professor in one of your STEM classes or maybe even non-STEM classes or look into our clubs and organizations on campus. Um, for instance, today we had the club fair and we had um, a member from the Bioengineering Society at BC come and speak. Um, and they, that's like one example of like an engineering club that already exists on campus that we didn't start, it was here before us. Um, you could definitely look into those clubs to see if there's more internships and opportunities. 
Um, but like Charlie said, um, all of our professors are so connected um, with their networks that when you come here, just definitely ask questions and they will definitely help pave the path to whatever interests you. So, yeah. Great. Thanks, Nava. And thank you, Elizabeth and Charlie. I think each and every college and university that all of our participants are considering also have uh, career centers. And Boston College has an incredibly engaged career center that while they work within clusters, uh, technology, science, STEM clusters, um, government policy, economics clusters, uh, you will receive a lot of career advising from as early as your first year, if you'd like, uh, at Boston College that will lead you to opportunities, again, for internships and connections uh, outside of campus with Boston College alumni, but with also those who are seeking Boston College students as well. So thank you so much for your perspective on that. And I know that's on the mind of a lot of prospective students and their families as they're considering these types of big decisions. Um, Glenn, we've talked about this in the past and, I, and I'd just like to bring it forth because so many people in our Q&A are asking questions about international options uh, and opportunity to study abroad as an engineering student. I will, I will tell everyone first, while studying abroad has really been um, put on the back burner over the past year and a half for pandemic purposes, it is starting to open up a little bit. And it's based more off of the foreign university where our students are able to have access to. Um, so some students are actually studying abroad this semester and hopefully more will be studying abroad in the spring. That's campus wide. But Glenn, how about the future of HCE students and their opportunities to perhaps spend some time away from campus in an international setting? So I think, you know, getting a, a international experience is, um, you know, very important to students. It's something I think students really want more of um, these days. So there's a couple opportunities we're working on. Um, you know, obviously these are our first students and so they uh, haven't had the opportunity yet to study abroad, but uh, we think most of them are probably generally at Boston College. They like to study abroad during their junior year. One of the things we're working on, matter of fact, I had a meeting earlier today on this um, with the uh, Dean of the nursing school is, can we work together with other programs? And instead of studying abroad where our students go to another university and those options are there and study there a semester, can we send our students to different countries where they're actually working on projects and applying their engineering knowledge um, to help people, you know, especially in low resource communities? And how can our students bring that knowledge that they've learned through their technical engineering courses and their non-technical engineering courses? Because that is just as important to really address real problems in the world that you know, currently exist. And so um, thinking about the opportunities to work with you know, our colleagues in, in the nursing school and you know, nursing students, uh, they're on the front lines. They really see what patients need when it comes to their health. Um, for our students to work alongside them and to help to use their technical knowledge to address, uh, you know, potential health problems is going to be tremendous. There's a lot of opportunities, I think, internationally there. And so that's one of the things that we, we hope to be able to provide our students uh, with an opportunity there. Great. Thank you, Glenn. Um, I'd love to uh, turn this back to the students for just a moment. Um, you know, there's so much to being a university student that takes place outside of the classroom as well. Your workload is intense. You've got a lot on your plate in terms of, especially over the first two months of becoming acclimated as a university student. Um, have you been able to take advantage of some of the great traditions of Boston College uh, that take place over the course of the fall semester, whether that be tailgates before football games or watching the, the uh, the running of the Boston Marathon in October rather than uh, when it traditionally happens in April. What does your life look like as you move inside the classroom to outside of the classroom back and forth? Um, how has that transition experience worked for you? Yeah, I can start us off on this question. Um, I would say that I have really, really, really enjoyed um, experiencing BC outside the classroom. Um, the tailgates um, for the football games have been very fun. The hockey games have been very fun. They've started recently, so there's been um, just a few these past few weekends. Um, I actually also attended the Boston Marathon, which was very exciting. Um, I attended with one of the students from engineering. It was really, really exciting just to see how even um, like so close to campus, um, like the Boston Marathon like happens and I like, can just walk down 
um, to Cleveland Circle and just have like a front row seat and just watch a really, really um, incredible and um, like monumental like event um, in BC. I think BC makes it very accessible for students to have fun and to balance their workloads. Um, I don't think I've had like an issue, like, you know, trying to find something fun to do or just in between classes. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'd say like, there's always something to do on campus. Um, they provide lots of great resources and it's really, really fun just to build your community um, outside your classes. So yeah, I'd say it's been good so far. It's very fun. I recommend going to the tailgates, hockey games, and the Boston Marathon. They're all very <laughs> exciting. <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, when I was looking at colleges, I didn't realize how much I wanted to be near a city. I knew I definitely didn't want to be in a city, but um, coming from Baltimore, I, I wasn't, that just wasn't something I was really thinking about. And I, I've gone into Boston probably every weekend since I've gotten here. It's so accessible to get to from the T. It's probably a 35 minute T ride or like total trip, like walking to the T and getting on the T. Um, public transportation in Boston is truly amazing. That's also not something I really considered. Um, Boston itself is just such a college friendly town or city. It's, it's a whole city. It's not even a town. Um, there's so much to do. And I actually have a bucket list of like all the things that I want to do before I graduate in Boston, because there's so much to do. You'll, you'll never run out of things to do. And a lot of it is like very cultural. So you're not just going to tailgates while well, they are very fun. You actually get like a, a really nice cultural experience as well, being so close to Boston. Yeah, um, I agree. I've gone into Boston a couple of times. It's a pretty cool city. My mom grew up in the area, but I'm getting, trying to get I'm trying to get to know it a little better. Um, I've gotten involved with a bunch of different groups uh, around campus. I'm on the club rugby team, which is pretty fun. It it's enough of a commitment that I've gotten really gotten to know the guys on the team, which has been also another nice community. Um, but it's not too much that I can't do other stuff, which is really nice. Um, I'm also doing for Boston, which is one of BC's uh, service opportunities. So I'm doing. G, or um, doing ESL, which is English, English as a second language for adults at like a local middle school. Um, so that's nice to get off the of campus and kind of see um, what it's like in the city um, where there's, you know, a lot more going on. There's a lot of poverty, a lot of food insecurity and things like that. Um, and it's, it's, you can, it's easy to forget about that stuff when you're kind of isolated on campus. So which is another thing what's nice to be so close to, to Boston is just those things are very um, they're very close, and that's mm -hmm. that's something that's very important, especially with like the human-centered nature of the engineering program. Um, also, football tailgates, hockey games, those have all been super fun. Um, just hanging out in my dorm, you know, late at night, uh, and getting to know all the new people who are around me. Um, it's just been it's been a great experience so far. So I'd have definitely had a great time, and I'm not lacking in things to do. That's awesome. Um, I know I've seen Charlie at the uh, ice hockey game, so I know he enjoys those. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, you've been here for two months, and uh, I just can't wait to see what you guys continue to do over the course of this year, but also the mentorship role that you're going to have with the 50 incoming students uh, with the new cohort uh, as they come in next year. I can't wait to see how that relationship develops. I just want to take a couple minutes because I know we're coming up on nine o'clock. Um, because several questions have come in just asking about uh, admission numbers, um, what that looked like from last year, are there projections or predictions for the year ahead. Um, I have some data that I can share with, with our audience, and I'm happy to do so uh, with regards to last year's class, and then we can talk a little bit about the application process for this year's class. Uh, but last year we received about 600 applications of the greater 40,000 applications that Boston College received for undergraduate admission, 600 specifically for the human-centered engineering majors. Uh, we admitted 130 of them. So we admitted roughly 22% of the students who applied to human-centered engineering. Uh, and of the 130 that, that we admitted, we enrolled the 28 that make up the first year cohort. Um, with that, you know, a lot of questions came about with regards to test scores and what are the averages? What, what does that look like? Well, last year, Boston College was test optional, as was most every other university in the country uh, due to access and due to uh, the pandemic. Uh, we will remain test optional for this year, but I can share with you that last year, 
uh, Boston College with regards to HCE applicants, 56% of the students who applied for human centered engineering, um, or, I'm sorry, 56% of the students that were admitted to the human centered engineering uh, program submitted testing. Um, and 18 of the students that enrolled, 18 of the 28 submitted tests. So more than more than half, but not all. Uh, and that is something that from an admission standpoint, when we're talking about being test optional, you do have that option. If you choose not to take a test, if you have taken a test and you choose not to submit your score, uh, whether you're applying to HCE or any other academic program at Boston College, you have that choice right now. And we will honor that um, and read your application and make an admiss admission decision with or without those test scores. If you just look at the averages of those uh, who make up our first year class within HCE, the average test score from an a SAT standpoint is a 1505 and the average ACT score is a 34 within this initial cohort. A lot of questions also came about with regards to math preparation and science preparation. Uh, Glenn and I have talked a lot about this and we just wanna make sure that students that are coming into our HCE program uh, are prepared to take college level calculus. What happens within the dynamics of our admission process at Boston College is most of the students that are gonna be competitive for HCE and in general from an admission standpoint are typically at a calculus level, not all the time, but typically at a calculus level. So we do see the majority of the students that were admitted last year in a calculus course in high school, whether that be AP, AB, APBC, higher level math at an IB program, taking an honors calc. But we are sensitive knowing that not every high school has the same track in terms of what you can take. Not every high school has the same resources in terms of the math that you're able to take. So every application, while those are the norms and what we typically see, we're sensitive to circumstance when, when it comes to math background and when it comes to science background, but we need to feel comfortable that you'll be able to succeed in college level calculus and college level physics as well. Um, Human-centered engineering students, the application is virtually the same as every other applicant to Boston College. You apply into the Mario C. College of Arts and Sciences, you select human-centered engineering as your uh, major of choice, and then that asks, then you are then directed to submit a supplemental essay response to a question that is based off of human centered engineering. So while there's five prompts on our supplement that all other students at BC select one from to answer, human centered engineering students are asked to, to respond to the specific HCE response. That's really the only difference. And also, I know a question came through if you apply to human centered engineering, and you're not admitted into engineering, are there other opportunities to be admitted into arts and sciences at Boston College? Yes, it's possible. So when you apply to human-centered engineering, you're also asked to select a second major if you'd like. That means that you may not be admitted to engineering, but you may still be admitted into the Marcy College of Arts and Sciences to explore another academic avenue. Just because you're not admitted into human-centered engineering doesn't mean you're automatically admitted into arts and sciences. It just means you may be considered within the greater context of our pool for admission into arts and sciences as well. So hopefully that makes sense uh, as you're moving through the application and preparing to apply to Boston College. But if you want to apply, or if you're considering, strongly considering human-centered engineering, it is absolutely essential that you apply through the common app, or I'm so, sorry, when the supplement asks you, Marcy College of Arts and Sciences with an intended major of human-centered engineering. That way we can read your application and present you possibly with that opportunity. Um, it's 9.02 and I promised uh, all of our panelists, students and Glenn alike, uh, that we would end at nine o'clock as this is a school night, it's a Monday night, we've got a lot going on. I know that there are a lot of questions that we did not get to. I, we tried to get to most of them, but we did not get to all of them. Um, I do encourage you as you move forward with your college search, continue to engage with Boston College current students. Uh, if you have opportunities to, to connect with uh, BC students via the admission office with our campus uh, programming like tours and information sessions, our Eagle for a Day programs where you're able to shadow students to class, that is great. 
Glenn, I know that you and, and your staff have been incredibly gracious in answering questions for prospective students and their families, talking through some of the details that we in the admission world, it's a language we just don't speak. Uh, so, so we have always been uh, very thankful for your participation and um, it, you know, completely up to you in, in terms of uh, how much of that you want to do moving forward, but we always appreciate yep, that collaboration. Totally happy. Yep. Yeah, we're totally happy to, you know, to address them and, you know, if students are here taking a tour, they want to meet with us. If we have time, we're happy to do that. If it fits in our schedule, you know, um, you know, our students, I don't want to, you know, volunteer them, but, you know, um, they're out there too. And so, you know, if, uh, if the opportunity exists for them, uh, also sometimes we'll buy them pizza and they'll be with some of the students and, and talk to them about the program. But yeah, Lynn, I think, you know, a decision like this is a very, very important decision in, in, you know, in students' lives. Um, it's something that they should really look into. Um, I love Boston College and I hope that everybody, you know, enjoys it also. Um, and it, that's really important to, to think of. I guess one thing we didn't talk, talk about is the form of education. And I just really want to leave you, you know, thinking about that there because at Boston College, one thing I, I really learned quickly on in, in my time here is it's more than just the academics. It's more than just the technical knowledge. And so they really believe about educating the entire student, which is much, much more than just the academics. We want our students to be happy. We want them to li live fulfilling lives. Um, and that's important to us also, so. Yeah, thanks so much, Glenn. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, I, and Glenn, that would be a perfect last word, but I'm gonna give the last word to the students as well. And uh, Charlie Nava and, and Elizabeth, I'm gonna just ask you, is there a, a parting piece of advice that you would provide to the to all of the, the, the students that are viewing this uh, session, maybe a parting piece of advice as you just went through this process less than a year ago. Um, so if you were in their shoes doing it all over again, anything that you would mention in terms of a way to approach this process? No pressure. Stressful. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we were in your shoes and we get it. It's, it's very stressful. So. Take some time to unwind every once in a while, um, but also um, just you're you're gonna everything will kind of work itself out in time. And if you give yourself fully to the opportunities that you get, um, then you're gonna get the most out of them. So you don't have to get offered like the best or the biggest or anything. Um, just whatever you whatever you set your mind to, um, you 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 can work yourself um, to a spot where you're happy and where you're satisfied. So that's my advice. Yeah. Thanks, Charles. I agree. I would say also just take some time to do a little bit of self-reflecting um, and really just be yourself in your application and let that shine through. Whatever makes you excited, whatever makes you happy, whatever you're passionate about, whatever that drive is, write about it and show it in your application um, because they really just want to see who you are for yourself. Um, and I'd also say apply to BC engineering. It's the best decision I made and I love it here. And I know you will too. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, very similar. I don't have much to add other than just, you're the same student that you are now as you will be December 15th or April 1st when decisions come out. So no matter what happens, you're, you're the same you. You work just as hard and you should still be proud of yourself no matter what. I know it's a terrible process. I have so much to say about the application <laughs> process in general, not just to BC, um, but it, it's it's a lot and take time for yourself and be kind to yourself. Um, that's all you can really ask. Great. Um, so Professor Glenn Gaudet, thank you for, for certainly all of your words of wisdom and, and the insight into the program this evening. Uh, Elizabeth, Nava, Charlie, again, we just love handing it over to students and having you, you speak about your, your life and your campus experiences, uh, you're a fabulous resource. Um, to all of those viewing, uh, it's 9.07, so we want to wish you a, a very good rest of your evening, but we can't thank you enough for spending some time with us, learning about this really special program at BC, and learning about Boston College and the culture here in general. Uh, again, I'm David Weber. You're always welcome to reach out to the admission office, to visit the admission office for tours, for information sessions. Um, we can't wait to get to know you a little bit better along the way. But for now, we're going to sign off. And, and again, thank you so much for being part of our program tonight. Have a nice night.
Thank you.